which may be objectionable to certain viewers. Welcome to the Territory. Tonight's program is devoted to the filmmaking team of Lee Murray and David Smith, who come from the Dallas area. We'll look at a recent conversation which took place in Austin between Ed Hegett and Tom Schatz, who teaches at the University of Texas at Austin. A little bit later in the show, we'll look at the featured film, The Case of M. Hacksaw, and what we'll do now is look at an excerpt from that piece. She was looking at me curiously swinging her school satchel in front of that freaky message. You look so funny, Cindy said, as we got nervous and fidgety. You look so funny, Cindy said, as we got nervous and fidgety. You look so funny, Shelly said, as we got nervous and fidgety. Then I bolted the door went to the kitchen and poured a glass of orange juice. Continued on page 49. When Cindy had settled herself at the piano again, Cindy called out, Mom, Mom would you like Mom, to hear the new first note? would you like to note? hear the new first note? I'm Ed Hugitz, director of the Southwest Media Project, and I'm Tom Schatz, professor of film and television at the University of Texas, and what you just saw was an excerpt from a piece we're going to see in its entirety later in the show. The piece is The Case of M. Hacksaw. It's a film by Lee Murray, Murray and, David, and David, David Smith. Lee and David are from Dallas. They went to North Texas State where they made this film as part of their master's thesis. Uh, the film is not your ordinary narrative film. It's, it's, uh, it's unconventional, and I guess just even from that opening piece, we might discuss what is unconventional about it. Uh, first of all, what is the story? There does seem to be, there is a slight narrative lurking in there somewhere. It has something to do with uh, Peeping Tom voyeurism, kind of a Lolita story, a strange relationship between a mother and a daughter and a strange relationship between someone who's writing the story and the story itself. Yeah, she's getting notes from somebody who's telling them uh, actually pieces of the story that somehow get worked into their life and influence them. And so ultimately this thing is not just a story, but it's about how we tell stories. And if there's one thing that I think characterizes the work of these artists, it is their concern for what we might say kind of are the the formal qualities of telling stories, or the, the basic ways that we structure stories. Uh, okay, well, wait, 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 wait. Why would anybody care about me? No, I just want to sit there and watch the movie. I mean, what is this formal stuff? I mean, that's a good question. Uh, there, there is a long-standing tradition in art, in all art, I think, uh, especially among uh, critics and the more intellectual, say, artists themselves. There's a long tradition of what often is termed self-reflexivity or self-consciousness, being aware of the process of making art. Now, why is that important for the viewer, you might ask? Uh, won't that bore the viewer to death? Well, th I think there was an assumption implicit in this work and the work of a lot of artists that in certain ways we are programmed by popular culture, we're programmed by movies, television, advertising, magazines, and that life it, imitates art. Yes. Or yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And if we look at one of their earlier work, which I just so happen to have here, uh, this is called the untidy story of Goldie Showers. I think we can see their concern with that. We see uh, a uh, female character who is, in fact, uh, I think uh, she's waiting for her husband to come home, and she's, uh, a, he's bringing a friend, and she's imagining how she should meet them. And one, and one thing that's already been set up is that she reads a magazine called Untidy Stories, and that she, 
she basically conceives of her life as a story in a romance magazine and as the advertisements that are contained yeah. uh, by the story. Let's take a look at the way. Chuck would be really disappointed if he brings his friend home and I'm not looking my best. Finally, she made it. <laughs> I mean, she looks exactly like uh, magazine uh, um, advertisements. And there are moments, this is shot in obviously in black and white video, a, a fairly uh, primitive technology, but there are moments in this that are remarkable visually. And they, you know, th these guys clearly are working from the cosmetics poured into the toilet uh, with this heavily lit white porcelain environment uh, to, this, to these very nice silhouettes. There are moments in this that are visually striking, and they do take us out of a very banal, mundane kind of image of contemporary existence to something much more stylized, right. something that we, I think we do associate with uh, advertising the media. Let me pick you up, though, on, on this issue of, obviously, they portrayed her as someone who's trapped mm -hmm. by uh, the magazines that, that, uh, that she reads. First of all, I think it's somewhat condescending. Uh, I think that all of us, at one level or another, uh, can't escape the influence of the media, the influence of certain belief systems, etc. At the same time, I think even those of us, even those of us who do adapt, you know, very fashionable ways of life, etc., etc., do try to try to plug into images of romantic love, courtship, marriage, uh, images of beauty that are dictated to a large extent by the popular culture industries, by advertising, the mass media. Uh, I think all of us have some capacity for reflection, some capacity to think about how we do buy into certain belief systems, certain value systems, certain materialistic uh, structures. But at the same time, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a basic, di dare I use the word, dialectic of our lives, that we, that we are, I think, aware of this and critical of it, but at the same time, it's, it's very difficult for us to avoid it. And I think for very good reason, because there are ways in which we do want to look good for one another, uh, whether or not that's determined by something that's natural to humanity, or whether it's something that's imposed on us from outside is a question that no one's ever going to answer. Yeah, the only thing, I mean, what I would like to kind of put together with that is this next sequence. She's, she's obviously, the filmmakers have kind of finally got her in the full ecstasy of Vogue magazine. And <laughs> then let's see what they do to us. I mean, he's interrupted this fantasy, this illusion, with the character almost in a documentary fashion speaking directly to the camera saying, I know my husband doesn't notice me like this. He's into cars. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if there's anything that redeems this piece for me, ultimately, or at least pulls it out of that kind of simplistic, we're all victims of the media perspective, it's these very odd moments throughout the film where we, where we cut away to a space that's not defined. And we, we clearly are dealing with the characters out, out of character, in effect, commenting on their lives and their behavior and their values. And it does, it does give the piece 
a rather odd dimension. Now, uh, now let's take that back to the business of the unconventional form. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what would be the advantage of of creating a, uh, a narrative, a story, mm -hmm. in such a way that you, you have a fantasy, then you have a documentary, then you have, say, a realistic fiction. Why have these multi-levels? That's a good question. I, re I really think that, that these filmmakers, that uh, Murray and Smith would, would like us to do in our everyday lives what this character is doing at this very moment, which is somehow disengaging ourselves from all the kind of values that inform our lives and say why. You know, why, why do I conceive of romantic love the way I do? Why do I conceive of exclusive sexual interpersonal relationships the way I do? Why do I perceive, uh, why do I think of beauty in terms of clothing, in terms of cosmetics, in terms of cars? Yeah, I think they want us to make decisions about those things. I don't think that necessarily they're making pejorative things about some of that fantasy. I, they themselves are, in an, are having a great time picturing their favorite images may be those magazine images well let's go on let's go on a bit okay man, and talk about that because there's a moment that comes up here that's i think it fairly is interesting brad. it is brad he is played by steve carter goldie this is my new friend brad brad meet my little retained ring goldie okay now here we have a, a shot if i can get a little better image a little bit better, right out of Gentleman's Quarterly, right, right out of GQ. Um, and, you know, the implication here is that it's not only her image of herself, but it's the way she sees the world. She sees the world as if it were moments out of advertising in a, you know, in a slick magazine that she got for she two wants, bucks. She wants, she desires anyway to see it that way. It seems that way. Now, whether or not, uh, you know, whether or not the filmmakers are reinforcing, you know, th th our inability to escape the media or whether they're really genuinely encouraging us to somehow step back and realize how we make sense of the world and how we use the media, how we use love stories, how we use uh, just the trappings of popular culture somehow to make sense of our lives. If we can step back and make sense of that critically, I, I think we've really accomplished something. Let's go on, look just a bit more. That's nice creepy guy here. Oh, it's all right. Goalie works hard on it. Come on in and idle your bush and supper ought to be out in a minute. Yeah, sure. I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that Chuck and I have ever really been friends. Uh, every once in a while, we might go hit a hit a strip joint or a porno movie, but maybe go bowling. And, but as but as far as friends go, uh, a friend is just somebody that uh, doesn't know you very well. You know, hasn't found out what you really like. Again, we have the interruption it's here to the documentary to, the re to reveal the real person to, in many ways, dispel that illusion that she has about Brad as something uh, romantic. Right. You know, you know, Chuck, I've always wanted to be in auto parts. There's something really down to earth about parts and shit. You know, when, when a guy comes in and he's looking for an axle flange and he needs it right away, I, I kind of take pride in knowing exactly where it is and then I can get him for him. You know, like row five, third shelf, third bin from the right. Well, it's good to have someone on the team who really appreciates the importance of the job. what I think is at stake in these films most of all is that that issue of plot of story mm -hmm. ultimately involves identity and recognition and recognition and and, and the, the the problem of, of finding an identity that's true somehow to our natural selves if, if there is such a thing in this civilized world that we live in and that that if we can really make contact with one another beyond these kind of layers upon layers of of uh, kind of re, uh, preconceived images that we have of one another and how we always kind of manufacture
for ourselves and for the people that we relate to, images that have come from somewhere outside of ourselves. I think, I think if there's one thing that holds both pieces together, it is this issue of identity and how identity is bound up in repression and especially sexual repression and that we, that we have gradually learned to live our lives in a way that's acceptable in terms of normative behavior, but that ultimately there's a part of us that can't get out. And that, that you know, somehow, and, and the fact that we refer to, say, the editing process in classical narrative as psychological editing or invisible editing, that, there, that, there, there's, that movies are part of the collusion. Movies are, that we watch stories that seem to us to be real, that the, the very technique of, we, when we watch a movie, we don't realize there are 500 to 700 separate cuts in that movie, that there are separate shots. It seems to flow naturally. It seems to flow in a continuum. These guys are continually rupturing that continuum and getting us to think about the ways in which we create narratives in our own heads, as the character here does, and the way that filmmakers create narratives on the screen. But, uh, as I said before, I think one of the things that that keeps this in the ballpark of kind of classical storytelling is the fact that we do have a central character. We have a governing sensibility. What's going on in her head dominates. And what's at stake for her dramatically, her marriage, her relationship with her husband or lover, those things, those things tend to dominate the action. And we can, uh, I think, there are ways in which the average viewer, uh, if he or she wants to, can, can disengage from all this formal technical razzmatazz and just try to follow the story. Now that's something that I think is virtually impossible in the case of M. Hacksaw, which is a piece, again, that we're going to be looking at its entirety, and which is extremely aggressive, I think, in denying our expectations, setting up situations which seem to be narrative, which seem to be dramatic, which seem to center on a, a specific character, and then kind of pulling our feet out from under us time and time again, and forcing us to kind of renegotiate the whole experience. When I woke up, Mark was sitting by my bedside, holding my hand. A thousand different feelings and questions were all mixed and quiet. For one terrifying instant, I thought I was shaking and I felt ridiculous. Lots of people have binoculars. I have no proof against Cindy. I could hardly believe the time had already come, but she had recently... Mm. But she had recently had her first period and was just starting to be aware of other female problems. I smiled to myself at her message. I loved what I saw in your window last night. I'll be watching for more tonight. Leave the building. But the bluish glow from Shelley's TV set was still showing through the crack under her door. She must have turned the sound very low.
What could it mean, I wondered. Had I actually been so careless as to sleep? But the bluish glow from Shelley's TV set was still showing through the crack under her door. She must have turned the sound very low. I smiled to myself at her crumpled note again. When Cindy had gone to her room, I found the police and told them the whole story of my harassment. Mark was right. They weren't very interested. They told me to hang on to the notes for handwriting analysis and to report any further messages. When I hung up, the place seemed so still and quiet. He mixed some pretty potent whiskey sours, and I started to relax as we sat at his kitchen table and discussed my alternatives. I feel so much better knowing you're looking out for me, Mark. I was but thinking listen, fast. Why don't you call and me? And then a sudden again. spark of hope. And there was no evidence in the outer anywhere. room. And Mark's I'm voice Mark calling. Kelsey. Nancy. I may have been Nancy, are you all right? Myself think. I feel so much better knowing you're looking out for he me. He looked Mark. at me with such but tender listen, concern. Why don't you call me? His hand reaching to touch my shoulder but listen, seemed so natural. Why don't you call me Nancy today? again? Hey, and there was no evidence like anywhere a drink, of a Mrs. Said, Mark Kelsey. If it's too early for a I, cocktail, I'll I may have been foolish to even tea. let myself think. Nancy, it's Mark. Are you all right? I realized I Nancy, wanted his arms it's around Mark. me at that Are you moment. all right? I stepped out I into the hallway I wanted with him, his arms gently around closing my moment. door. I stepped Skip, out into this the may hall. sound strange, but have you ever noticed anybody, probably somebody... When I got home from the drugstore Saturday, my heart was pounding as I opened the mailbox. This time there was some legitimate mail, a letter from my mother, a magazine I subscribed to, and a notice of a PTA meeting from Cindy's school. But as I pulled them out, the dreaded index card fluttered to the floor. I loved what I saw in your window last night. I'll be watching for more tonight. Your secret admirer. She was looking at me curiously, swinging her school satchel in front of that freaky message. You look so funny, Cindy said, as we got nervous and fidgety.
You look so funny, Cindy said, as we got nervous and fidgety. You look so funny, Shelly said, as we got nervous and fidgety. Then I bolted the door, went to the kitchen, and poured a glass of orange juice. Continued on page 49. When Cindy had settled herself at the piano again, Cindy called out. Mom? Mom, would you like Mom, to hear the new first note? would you like to note? hear the new first note? I've got, to, I've got to disguise myself when I go out in public to drop off the stories because I don't want anybody to recognize me for who I am. It's a, like a public service I'm doing here. So, uh, you know, I don't really want any credit for myself. I can't make any kind of profit off of it or it's all wrong. I haven't, I haven't slept in, in two years because I, I hate that drowsy sinking sensation. Uh, uh, you know, I, I try to stay awake so I can remember things, and yeah. I, I stay awake so I can remember things. You know, everything stays sharp and clear. And, well, nothing gets a uh, uh, what's the word stigmatized. Well, uh, well, maybe that's not the right word, but you know what I mean. The brain likes to sleep. It's, free and it's creative when it's sleeping but the eyes they like to stay awake uh, they, eyes like they like reality they don't really like fantasy that much they're looking for reality you know uh, and then your eyes they'll look at anything they'll look at man the most horrible disgusting thing man it gets your little rods and cones going man they, perk up with like little little hard-ons inside your eye, man, and they're ready to go, you know. For your protection. I, mean, I used to be a voyeur. I always be constantly watching people trying to figure out what they're doing. I think that's it. But I don't do that anymore because I couldn't couldn't see everything. You know, the window shades are never completely open. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, you just collect things, mainly a lot of written materials. I like them because the words, you know, they don't ever fade out. They stay in focus. You know, they're not like pictures or memories. Everything stays sharp and clear. Okay. You now words, they can they can get kind of sticky though, and they can start clinging to each other. So <clears throat> what I do is I try to sort them out and separate them, and clean them up. You know, make them bright and shiny like, you know, just like your eyes. Keeping an eye on the courtyard. It means like uh means like having a having an eye like a window that everything shines into. Uh, this is what I do. 
my agent brings me a stack of raw material. I cut out the words, and I glue them on to glue them together, and then I type the sentence type the sentences that come out together on uh, index cards. Yeah. The cards, they tell a story. You can start at any point. I kicked off my shoes and laid back on the bed listening to Cindy at the piano. She, she was wearing a pair of tight jeans, and her piano a little too tight, I thought, and a lowest cut blouse all, I'd ever seen on her. Love practicing. I had known she was and unusually developed for her age. She had been wearing bras for a year. Mom? Mom? Mom. reconciling myself with these little blue lines because uh, they kept the lines of print separated to where it uh, separated the meanings of, you know, the different lines and stuff. So I was trying to figure out a way to get that stuff off there you know, and trying to boil them. Put them in here and stir them around for a while. Works pretty good. Sometimes. <laughs> Anyway, after I boil them for a while, kind of hang them up here to dry out. And uh, when the lines come off of them, I know which ones to use. I take all the ones without the lines, wrap them up in these little, little bags here, put a title on the top of the stack, sign the last card, X, friend. Drop them off in the mailbox or just, you know, anywhere somebody will find one. And I just wait. Just wait. Pretty soon they turn up. They turn up in print. I saw a story in a women's magazine last week that was based on uh, one of my little bags of story here. Hey, look at this. Look at this. My daughter's voice startled me, and I whirled around, crumpling the card in my fist. I guess I was already expecting the writer of that note to turn up in any moment.
I called the drugstore and asked them to send over a prescription I had used before. Something a little stronger would be nice. Something to help you sleep. A nice, deep sleep. I called the drugstore and asked them to send over a prescription I had used before. Something a little stronger would be nice. Something to help you sleep. A nice, deep sleep. Are you Mrs. Page, he said with a friendly smile. Nancy, he said Nancy very softly. Page, Cindy Try said. not to worry. Oh, I wasn't sure I'm going to be looking out for you. First name. Although, Although I wasn't sure why she was, why was emphasizing the first, first name. name. I it certainly so wasn't ready for another relationship man. with a man. Probably somebody Nancy, he said very only. softly. Try somebody not to worry. I'm going to be looking out, out for you. position of your window. Which it's so good to have an attractive man, I probably someone in this same apartment building, someone who can figure out from the position of your window sign. which apartment what number I don't was yours. Understand is what you think you're seeing. I, never leave I gave a frustrated sigh. And what I don't understand is, is what you think you're seeing, Cindy. or how yes, you're watching. Said very softly, I never leave my window shades worry. open. Find out about what? She asked brightly. Then I remembered those awful women on TV doing it in a movie. It was one of those houses where, well, you know, they spent so much more time together at night. I made up my mind. Cindy flirted outrageously all during dinner, and I was feeling like a drab housewife and cook instead of the hostess. But I was happy she was having a good time, even. I was only 31, and with a blush, I wondered if I wasn't interested in a 12-year-old child. Anyway, Mark had already done more for me than he could possibly have imagined. By bringing that misplaced rent receipt, he had shown me how easy it is. Mark had already done more for me than he could possibly have imagined. 
by bringing that misplaced rent receipt, he had shown me how easy it is for something to find its way into the wrong mailbox. About half an hour later, the door buzzer sounded. It was Skip, delivering my order. Hi, Skip, I said. Am I glad to see you? I sound sort of hoarse. Just a headache. I may be catching a cold or something. I took some medicine for it. I'll be okay. I just wanted to check on you. His voice was so warm and concerned. With another irresistible smile, he left. rapturously. He's super looking, she said rapturously. Aren't you glad he's living so close to us? Nancy, he went on, I've been keeping an eye on the courtyard, but nobody's been anywhere near your window. Thanks, Mark. That's very sweet of you. Thanks, Mrs. Page. Good night. As he turned away, I said impulsively, Skip. Hi, Skip, Skip I said. You make Am I glad to see you? I worry. worry. I'm going to be looking, looking out for you. I'm Mark Kelly. I just want to check on you. I'm almost as new to you as you are. So warm and I moved in just last week. I lay, I lay there, there deep, frozen, right helpless, the hating myself for doubting oh, Mark, I'm, I'm for glad jumping to conclusions. This is my yard. It had been Skip right all along. Here. And I'd be page. okay. Another one? It was Mark. So and that was it. Was the drowsy, sinking sensation Hello. I'd been struggling against. My voice was weak and husky. Oh, Nancy, dear God, Mark. I thought. I can't right? let my self go to sleep give, now. Give but my head was whirling. Oh, darkness closing in around me. My head was I lay there, and frozen, helpless, and hating myself. We've only lived here for two days. Two days. Well, don't go anywhere alone at night. Creeps like this may follow you home. Oh. happy for the excuse to drop over and... Well, well, don't you? It had been Skip all along. And if you need any help getting settled and all, please call a medication and put in a tip for him. Was there anything I could possibly do for a father image young enough to seem romantic to her? 
Are you old Mr. Hacksaw? He's really weird. He's always looking out of his window with binoculars. Mr. Hacksaw? A light came on in the window above me. The shade slid up, and I realized it was Cindy's room. I was afraid to look. I just stood quietly for a long moment, leaning there, trying to control my breathing. From somewhere behind the shrubberies, not 50 feet away from me, a flashlight blinked on and off, its beam aimed toward the window. So it had begun. And a moment later, as I unfolded it, my fear was confirmed. I watched my 15-year-old daughter give a sex show. I watched my 12-year-old daughter give a sex show. I watched my 12-year-old daughter give a sex show. I watched my 15-year-old daughter give a sex show. I watched my 15-year-old daughter give a sex show. Come on, take it all off. I heard Skip's voice dimly, and then the squeaking of the bed springs. Was there anything I could possibly do for a father image young enough to seem romantic to her? Oh, oh Cindy. She's all right, Mark gently assured me. Cindy's just fine. She wasn't hurt, and the behavior? Did I really know my daughter, her dreams, frustrations, and feelings? any better than I had known Skip? Was her compulsion to strip in front of her window really good for Cindy? Come on, take it all off, I heard Skip's voice dimly. Oh, oh Cindy. I had known she was unusually developed for her age. She'd been wearing bras for a year, unconvincingly, I thought, and hugged her sensuously up her thighs across her tummy and over her breast and she began to caress herself her hands gliding at me mom are you okay as i started to call out to her she eased close she looked so innocent and vulnerable if you'll just relax you won't have any more worries now
Mom, would you like to hear the new story of my harassment? I rocked her gently in my arms. Oh, Cindy, it's my fault, too. Since the divorce, I've thought only of my own needs. I've been content to let you entertain yourself with TV every night. While I sat in my room feeling sorry, nervous, and fidgety. How many hours, I wondered, had she lived out these sexual fantasies alone in her room? starting to be aware of female problems. Are you old Mr. Hexaw? He's really weird. He's always looking out of his window with binoculars. Mr. Hexaw? You look so funny, Shirley said as we got them out. Then what should I do? It'll drive me crazy if these things keep coming. The dreaded index cards flutter to the floor. I tore off the unwanted message and dropped it gently. And then I remembered the awful women on TV doing it in a movie. It was one of those houses where, well, you know, they hang on to the notes for handwriting analysis and to report any further messages.
I could hardly believe the time had been placed in the wrong box, too. That was probably the answer. Quite a piece. That's quite a piece. Uh, and I think, you know, as we suggested before we looked at it, much more ambitious than the earlier stuff of Murray and Smith that we saw. And I think finally, in its own way, I think it gets at the issue of, of human identity and how that is bound up in uh, images of sexuality, sexual identity, and sexual repression, that we live in a society where we've learned to kind of channel our uh, our natural impulses into acceptable modes of behavior in terms of marriage, in terms of courtship, in terms of uh, well, either, uh, everyday behavior. Some people might say, well, why bring up sex? I mean, why are these independent filmmakers are always bringing up sex? And I, and I, I think the importance of sex here as a force driving uh, the story is that it is probably the, the symbol for that unstructured nature that, Absolutely. We, that we are as human beings that cannot be contained in any image or any idea of ourselves. And if we stop and think about how much advertising, and especially how much popular culture uh, narrative, you know, whether it's movies, TV shows, uh, particularly I think movies and romance stories say, how obsessed they are with sexuality and sexual imagery and the fact that we, that how it, in their own way, they work, they work on the one hand to repress our natural sexuality, and, and on, on the other hand, they're constantly displaying it. They're displaying that repression in certain kinds of ways. Now, for me, the question isn't only why is sex important, but it's, it's why uh, the, the role that, that popular culture plays in somehow containing that, and whether or not we can ever really break away. As I think, in, as we were saying before, we looked at this, these artists, I think, want us to somehow step back and see how all of this works somehow, how our identities are formed, how our values are formed, how the what role the media plays. And they want to pull back from that conformity that we tend to just buy into, accept, because it moves us. It, mm -hmm. it, it sort of puts us on automatic and we kind of live our lives according to the roles that have been identified for us. I mean, they really do want us to back off. Now, the risk there that I see in that is that by moving away from the conformity, moving away from the convention, mm -hmm. this kind of filmmaking risks losing the audience, loses the most important thing for me in a film, and that is the community, the sharing of ideas. Uh -huh. Do you run the risk in attacking conformity and being unconventional, do you run the risk of destroying your overall project, and that is of bringing people together? Sure, engaging the viewers uh, as, as a group and as individuals, I think, uh, in, an earlier, in an earlier show that we did, we looked at an artist who spent the entire, one of his entire film looking at the audience. In its own way, this is as much about the audience, uh, I think, as, as that piece, in that it, it gets us to think about, I think each of us individually, how we read stories, how we make sense of stories, how we structure them in our own minds, and how they contribute to helping us discover who we are. And now the question becomes, I think, for, the, for other artists as well as for uh, Murray and Smith, uh, can you, in effect, educate the viewer at that rather sophisticated cultural level and still, whether we use the word engage the viewer, entertain the viewer, do something that's interesting to the viewer, very difficult problem, and I think a fascinating one that artists are continually coming back to. Pearl and Michael accuse Katina and Steve of stealing Michael's welfare money and his bank books. Next week, the Territory will look at the films of Alexandra Anthony, and in particular, her film Yaya, which focuses on her family of Greek descent living in Shreveport. This is an excerpt from Yaya. Join us next week on The Territory. <laughs>